use these models of discounted cash flow and stuff like that that are not necessarily appropriate to to to, to start off. So I'm guessing this is one of the things that that you were talking about. You know how how do you address this? So that's a, that's a problem. So it could be a great technical team, but if they don't listen, I probably won't be mentoring, won't be investing. In our opinion, the space of best decisions lies here. Still your decision to make. Still a decision to make. Welcome to a new B Combinator podcast. My name is Pedro Gil. I'm investment manager here at B Combinator. And today I have the pleasure to be with Andri uh, Kostiuk, uh, co-founder of Alchemy Ventures, a deep mentoring and acceleration program based in Cyprus. Welcome, Andri. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. It's a pleasure and honor to be invited. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, one of the main things, just getting straight to the point that, uh, that I wanted to ask is that from your deep career, Uh, I believe you went. Uh, you started as a banker, maybe in commercial banking. Is that right? Sure. Okay, awesome. And and then at some point you actually switched to entrepreneurship, to mentoring, to business, to 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 uh, to this kind of stuff. And I actually saw one of your interviews where you said that uh, all all of the things that you learned from banking, you learned a lot of finance. But then the skills, the skill set that you needed to have to be in business, in entrepreneurship, were not the ones that you learned in 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 banking. So I wanted to know how this transition went so so if you could tell a little bit of the of the history why you changed when you changed and and what drove you to it yeah sure and uh, when i started my banking career back in 98 okay. i didn't know that the world fintech existed and i believe nobody did <laughs> so what if I, i was building for these 15 years in the okay. bank that was basically a fintech journey as okay. i understood much later on So when I divested in 2013, I had more free time on my hands. And uh, then naturally I came to the angel investment. Okay. Because that was more or less the same thing I was doing. I was always entrepreneurial. I didn't work for hire since 1992, I suppose. <laughs> But speaking about uh, your exact question of the professional qualities which are relevant for banking and for investment in startups, I understood much later that the focus is different because right. in banks you always analyze businesses, but you analyze the financials right. and you analyze uh, again the profit making capacity of a business, effectively speaking. In startups, you analyze the growth potential. Right. Again, you should not forget that business is about making money and the famous, you know, growth for growth model in the States demonstrated quite nicely that growth for growth doesn't work. Right. At the end of the day, you need to start making money out of the growth you managed to achieve. But still, when you compare the traditional business model with the startup business model, it's profit versus growth. What you're orient And as a banker, I was still using the, this approach. Right. Thinking about the stable business models, more than a growth business models, which effectively is a mistake when it comes to startups. Mm -hmm. And that was a lesson to learn. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I feel like one of the biggest mistakes, and, and I, ha I, have, I have had this conversation myself a hundred times, one of the biggest mistakes that we make in, in evaluating companies in these very early stages, it's that we tend to use those financial models that we use in the bigger financial uh, forecast. You know, we use these models of discounted cash flow and stuff like that, that are not necessarily appropriate to, to To, to start off. So I'm guessing this is one of the things that, that you were talking about. You know, they how, are not, how do you address this? They are not exactly because DCF works quite well, let's say, mm. in, when you have statistically significant chain of data. Okay, if you, if you have five, six years of data of sales, profits, whatever, okay, they can be extrapolated to a certain degree, of course. But in startups, you work with assumptions only. Again, if you speak about early stage startups, it's only assumptions. Mm -hmm. So building like, you know, a firm model based on soft data doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And that was my, again, I didn't do even this year, but I took those models which they presented, I think, more seriously than they deserved. <laughs> right. 
then I need to see the model still, but I need not the date. I need to see if they understand what they're trying to do. So if they have a convincing business model, if they can translate the English or Spanish or whatever language <laughs> into the language of numbers right. and explain why it will be like that. Right. That's the only thing I need from the financial model to understand that they know what they're speaking about. Okay, so 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 I understand from what you're saying that this is mostly not a business model capability, but a founder team capability of yeah. translating what they want to do into a business model. How sure. do you address the potential of a founder team rather than their business yeah. model? That's the first and foremost thing I take a look at. There's a famous saying that a good team will save a bad model while yeah. a bad team will kill a good one. Right. And there is a very clear explanation for that. It's uh, statistically impossible to come up with a good idea on the first try. So you'll have right. to pivot many, many times. To do that, you need to be a good team. Good team, again, meaning being relevant to what you are doing, mm -hmm. having enough experience in what you are doing, and cover all the key competences which you need to develop your business at this at the early stage. So meaning being was being being relevant to a business if somebody i don't know from a liberal arts come and say i'm building an ai model i would probably question the capability of doing that right same as if a mathematician will try to like you know to paint a picture right right to make so, a b2c kind yeah, of business sure, you really yeah. need to be in that place and the right. best businesses come from the customer pain which are is known like first hand Right, right, right. Absolutely. I feel like uh, there are many great teams that are really good at what they're doing, but but precisely they're not as good as they can be in, in pivoting because they tend, of course, like like we all do, to fall in love with their own ideas. So so how does your mentoring, like yourself and, and also Alchemy Ventures, uh, go into that uh, subject? Because you can address very good teams, but you also need to teach them some stuff, some of the stuff that they don't have. Sure. So what are the things that you know the team needs to have and what are the things that you know you can provide? Falling in love is very correct description of what mm. happens with those teams and what's the problem with many of those teams. <laughs> yeah. And for us as mentors, or for me as a mentor speaking from my own name, one of the biggest things is what I call educability. You know, there's another term, coachability. I don't like it much. <laughs> it right. comes from a different universe slightly. I like educability more. Right. And that means that my mentees should be able to listen to what I'm saying, to hear what I'm saying, to process that and make a decision, taking my opinion as another data point. Right. And disagreeing with me is fine. I actually, I'm not a stakeholder in the company. I'm just expressing my opinions. Right. Why it's a good thing, why it's a bad thing. I need to see that they listen, they hear, they process and they take decision mm -hmm. that's enough when i meet a person who behaves like this person knows best what's happening on around that's you know kind of a red light for me mm -hmm. i know myself that i don't know everything i can be as wrong as any other pe person around me and i need to listen to hear to process to make decision if somebody doesn't have this capability it's a deep personality tree right. which can't be easily fixed okay. it's normally fixed only with a kind of hard personal experience if right. ever if ever, <laughs> if ever. Right. so that's a, that's a problem so it could be a great technical team but mm -hmm. if they don't listen i probably won't be mentoring won't be investing okay okay awesome so so earlier in our conversation you were speaking about uh uh, how you address the potential of these founding teams and you were saying that normally founding teams tend to be really good at their hard skills so so probably something technical is is this something uh is it the only thing that you evaluate or do you also look into the potential of their soft skills when you are trying to mentor or assess the potential of a startup uh, once again for me uh, a good founding team is a prerequisite for continuous conversation right what makes a good founding team for me is that it's relevant to their project and that they have enough experience speaking of hard, hard uh, skills and if they 
kind of cover all the core competences which are needed at the early stage within the founding team. Right. Normally, that's these three pillars. And then I need to see them being editable, meaning that they can listen, can hear, can process, and can take informed decision based on my opinion as another data point, but hopefully an important data point. Okay. Again, being in disagreement with me is fine, but it should be an informed disagreement. Right, right. And that's how we move forward with those teams. So we sit together, we have a conversation, we exchange ideas, opinions, and if they listen, if they hear, not only to me, but to the world around, again, I'm not a prophet. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just a data point. So it, no, it's not like they will be not listening to me, but listen to other people. Right. They right. either listen to the world or they don't. It's right. very binary, you know, in how people uh, approach this issue. And if they don't, uh, they most probably the world will teach them a hard lesson. Right, absolutely. Yeah, I feel like uh, also aligned with what you're saying, it's something that, that we say here, a lot in Bitcoin Manager that the best due diligence, due diligence process that you can make is just having a relationship mm -hmm. with the team, just getting to know them for a couple of months, seeing actually how they work, sure. having a lot of talks, you know, and, and talking about experience, I wanted to talk about your experience as well. So what was your first experience outside of banking? So what was, what was that first thing that you started doing? As you said, that you haven't been uh, for hire for what more than 30 years, probably. So what was that first experience and what and what was the road to all the way up to Alchemy Ventures, which is what you're doing right now. <laughs> uh, when I was divesting from the bank, uh, I told everyone that I will never ever get closer to a desk again. You know, I will be just <laughs> sitting in a recliner and like don't bother even to call me. Right. So that kind of you know continued for <laughs> maybe three four months. Then I understood that this beautiful idea will not come to fruition <laughs> because I'm getting bored, unfortunately. <laughs> right. And uh, then I thought, what do I need to do with my life? I was 41 at the time. So hopefully I had another half of life <laughs> to right. live right. and not being bored to death prematurely. And, uh, you know, there are some small signs in life from time to time, which importance you understand much later. I was flying from somewhere to Barcelona, I guess, mm -hmm. and there was a time when there were still in-flight magazines, they still exist, but in-flight magazines were a bigger source of entertainment back of then. Of course, yeah. So I was kind of shuffling through pages and then I saw a classified ad, like a uh, global executive MBA program by Georgetown University and the Southern Business School. Okay. I said, okay, the Southern Business School is 10 minutes from where I live. And it's a reputable one. Georgetown University, I've been to Washington. I know that Georgetown is kind of, you know, mm -hmm. something very much embedded into the Washington DC life. It's a big and reputable school. I didn't know they both belonged to Jesuits and that was the connection. But oh. again, I didn't care anyway. So I called the admission team and they said, okay, we're closing the admissions for like six cohort and we'll be opening the one for the seventh in it was i think like july maybe in closer to the new year and i said okay so i spoke with them decided maybe it's a good idea finally i applied maybe one of the first in the cohort mm -hmm. got accepted and that was probably one of the most important things that happened to me oh, look at that. taking that journey right. again people were asking me like you are already an accomplished in a businessman what are you doing here again guys i'm First of all, I'm westernizing my experience. Right. And then I'm putting my language to knowledge into the matrix, into the framework. Right. Because proper MBA is not about teaching you many new skills. Mm -hmm. It's mostly about, again, like mentoring, probably, putting your already existing knowledge into the system, right. explaining you scientifically yeah. why some things you know work, they work. Yeah. And why something they don't work, they don't work. Absolutely. Like, yeah. What's the reason for that? Yeah, yeah. I feel like most uh, academic tenures, and, and actually I would love to dive deep into your academic tenure because I feel like right now you are a, a, you're a candidate for a DBA program. Is yes. that right? Yeah, yeah, I am. I, I'm, actually yeah, I'm actually considering a DBA myself, of course, mm -hmm. in many, many years from mm -hmm. now. So, so, so I would love to dive into that academic uh, aspect of your life because I feel like some people... Uh, 
this minute, like how much academic and, and research can actually apply into real time business. I feel like in business, we are uh, always uh, trying to, you know, using our 40, probably 80 hours per week, trying to do our business. And we forget that uh, taking that bigger picture into researching, into analyzing stuff. So, so yeah. How did your MBA uh, actually, in Esade, of course, here in Barcelona, actually impacted your career? First of all, I met Esade Business Angel Network right through the Esade right. MBA. It was one of my favorite professors, Luisa Alemani, who unfortunately left Esade, mm -hmm. but she is in London Business School now, so I think she she's doing yeah, quite she's, nice. Yeah, she's doing fine. Yeah, no, we are in touch, we okay. communicate. So, and she came to teach us speak with the class and then she said okay there's a business angel network so if you're interested like take a look so i did and then you know again i had a change of trajectory when i understood that what i kind of did professionally is very much aligned with being business angel idea right and uh, going from there, I started investing into startups. And so, then, so, so with the Sadevan, you started investing your first? Yes, I started uh, doing that with the Sadevan. I had first investment, then I started speaking with founders and okay. stood that something's missing from the picture. Okay. And that's exactly the soft skill component, that, as I formalized much later. But that was about mentoring the founders. Mm -hmm. in the things how to do business effectively okay so they knew how to do product they knew probably whom to sell the product but there was a gap into how to sell the product how to approach business development how to run a team mm -hmm. and that was my continuous conversations with many of them and that led me to dba because i understood that mentoring is an answer but what i'm doing and i started trying to understand more about the state of art and mentoring and startup mentoring mm -hmm. it turned out to be more an art than a science while right. there was definitely a potential to make it first a science than an art and uh, i decided to do to kind of go through to this research academic research pathway mm -hmm. with this theme that is very relevant to what i'm doing so the see my thesis I'm, I'm finalizing now is about how mentoring startup founders influences performance of early state ventures okay and the first step that i needed to do when i was accepted to dba i was i needed to prepare a dissertation proposal to do the dissertation proposal you need to do a literature review so to explain right. like where the knowledge is and what you plan to add and I knew there's not too many uh, papers on the subject, but I really didn't expect to see what I saw. I went to Google Scholar, to other base databases, and finally it turned out that overall there are between 50 and 60 papers over the last 25 years globally. Oh, that's, on, that's, not, that's it's not many. nothing. That's not many, yeah. It's nothing on this subject, exactly the second step of the journey. Okay. Because in startup mentoring is kind of two steps. We use coaching tools right. to improve the personality in terms of like being more efficient business person. Okay. But it's we don't do that to improve the business, the personality. We do that so that improves personality, improve the venture. And all the resources that are committed by the ecosystem are for okay. that second step. Okay. First is step is a tool, second step is a goal. And first okay. step is researched extensively, how mentoring, coaching influences improvement of a personality. There's right. tons of research on that. It's easier to research, easier to measure. Second step turned out to be almost non-research. So finally, in the systematic literature research, we have 32 papers of acceptable quality, 40, 32. 40% 40 of them is gray literature. So master's thesis, PhD thesis, so about peer review papers, it's about 60% of these 32 papers. Which was like what, 20 nothing. papers. Yeah, nothing. That's, that's, nothing, for nothing. Yeah, that's nothing for a doctorate program. True. And yeah. I said, okay, I said, there's a knowledge gap. <laughs> yeah, nice. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't understand why exactly at that moment. And when I started interviewing people, mm -hmm. it's 
again, it's probably what took somebody like me to be more or less efficient with this research. Right. Because you need access to investors and to men and to mentors. Right. And who I will agree to speak with you and then refer the mentees because it takes real effort to build this trust, you know, so that they can speak with you and they can refer you people. So hopefully I build it <laughs> somehow based on the fact that I had about 60, 70 interviews. Some of them I had to remove because of different uh, considerations, but still I ended up with 17 mentoring deals. Okay from eight or nine European countries. Okay, great. And I reached what they call a point of saturation, surgical saturation point, because I stopped receiving new data. Right. Okay. I started processing the research. And, and could you give like any preview on the on the results sure. that you were seeing? Like how the, does like overall how does mentoring actually impact the exactly. goals Exactly. That was the problem because in 80% of cases, probably, it took me some deliberate effort to come to the answer because people started to try to implement, for example, financial, financial KPIs. Mm. Okay, how can we isolate mentoring influence on increasing sales from everything else the company does? Right. And there is no answer to that because the answer is that's not possible. Yeah, yeah you cannot like do it. Not possible. Yeah, you cannot do it. Yeah. Another soft idea is like, okay, let's measure the personal improvement of the founder. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's exactly the problem <laughs> because that we can measure, but we don't measure that. We need to measure how this improvement influenced performance. And finally, I ended up with a single matrix, which is time saved. Time saved. Okay. Not operational. It's not like I mentor someone and I advise him to do this process in a different way. Mm -hmm. And now instead of a minute, it takes them 15, 30 seconds. Okay. Not about it. It's about helping them take more optimal decisions along the way. Okay. Meaning, I have another explanation for that. Let's say it's similar to a chess master, okay, yes. right. teaching somebody to play chess. And the first idea when you start, okay, there are the figures. They can make only these moves. Mm -hmm. So there are a subsection of legit moves and the bigger one of a legit. So you just can't make this move, right. even if you wish. Mm -hmm. But in this subsection of legit moves, there are better and worse moves, obviously. Mm -hmm. And our goal is to teach you to choose the more optimal moves within that segment of the legit ones. Right. It's very similar to what we are, to what we are doing as mentors. Mm. We just show you that, in our opinion, the space of best decisions lies here. Still, your decision to make. Right, right. Still, a decision right. to make. As a founder, because yes, because again, as you said before, I'm not a stakeholder. You're just it's a, your exactly. business. Mm -hmm. But that's what I can just suggest you how to do it, and that's about about it. And if I show you the right way, and if you do the le one the best legit move, you obviously save time or even win the game, right? Right, right. <laughs> So another thing which is in quite interesting is that I continued to process data and I thought, okay, I have these 17 deals. What else can I see from the general result? And in general, the mentors believe that they can save about third, 25 to 30% of the time. Oh, and mentees, uh, they're closer to 50. It's like a natural distribution graph. Okay. And then I said, okay, let's check with the groups, try to split them on the perception. One group where mentees perceive the savings are smaller, the other perceive savings are higher. The third one, they perceive the savings are more or less the same as mentors see it. Okay. And in the group where mentees saw the less efficiency, still uh, just one of the mentees told me that he doesn't believe in the mentoring and the concept, right. 
okay. which could be a biased opinion because his startup was a mentoring platform. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But anyway, okay. yes. Uh, normally, there are some outliers, but just just a few. Normally, everybody sees it as a, as a positive influence, but to a different degree. So in the group, I mean, it is perceived as a smaller, it was about 19%. Okay. of time saved. In the group where the highest was 49 and then the oh. middle about a quarter, 26, I think. Okay. So I said, okay, that's a huge difference. Like what happened? Yeah. I started to analyze data just with descriptive statistics. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, one of the first times it's kind of like jumped on me from the paper because in the group with less efficiency, mm -hmm. mentors themselves reported that they need to meet mentees like for about not uh, less frequently than a month i think okay for about an hour and effectively in that group they met them like once in 49 days i think so one so they kind of okay the frequency was, was long. longer okay and the session was uh, 48 minutes instead of a 60. also it was way more efficient it was yes they just underperformed according to their own standards and okay. startups okay. immediately saw that okay in the most efficient one the frequency was 23 days and the session was about the 60 minutes okay so, so it was very very clear so you need to continue seeing them quite often and this 23 days practically translate into bi-weekly or weekly meetings oh, yeah. at the beginning and monthly weekly monthly meetings as yeah. relationship and startup mature okay so it's very practical takeaway okay that's, and, that's, that's actually like like the best takeaway we, we also have some mentorship yeah. programs within here and and we notice this exact same thing that you're saying so we could be actually like, like a business case for you because yeah, sure like at the beginning we do bi-weekly sessions with the mentors from our startups but at point like at some point beginning month three month four maybe month six of the of the business development it's not necessary and, and it actually stops working for us mm -hmm. so so then we moved into meeting with them every six weeks every eight weeks even and that's when sure. when we take the best value out of those mentorship sessions yes and interestingly another takeaway from the yeah. control group let's say we should see it in an equal yeah they had way more meetings overall the average was i think about 30. While in the second one, the most efficient, so to say, it was 12. Okay. So that translates into that increasing number of meetings significantly doesn't work again. Yeah, exactly. So if 12 meetings didn't work for you, 30, 30 meetings yeah, not will, not will not work for you either. Yeah, and it's... that's really just here in the research. Well, again, we all know that more or less yeah, of course, by but, but, but then our that own into... experience. Yeah. But that taken from many cultural, different cultural backgrounds, different countries, yeah, different people. And it's just like seats right there. Yeah, yeah. Having it also like as as we were saying before, ha uh, having it with with the with the academic you know regime also it's, it's quite different from just our god as investors or entrepreneurs uh, i feel like this this whole business that you're doing on your academic journeys it also translate into uh, translates in, into what you guys are doing at, at alchemy ventures so so could you make like a like a little rundown apart from mentorship what is the whole mission and vision of, of alchemy ventures how are you guys sure. doing it what are you guys doing Again, uh, we can start from the academic side because okay. that's what we starting to do. Other thing that we saw is that another source of problem is a um, debt matching process. Because there is what we call now a pyramid of mentor rewards. Mm -hmm. And as mentors are not financially rewarded, at least immediately, you can have advisory shares later in the game, whatever. But you started doing that for the emotional reward. Right. And emotional reward is most probably is that the trusted relationship, as neurobiology tells us, it provokes release of additional oxytocin mm -hmm. to the brain. Right. So this mentoring relationship rewards you directly. Okay. Without you needing to do something unpleasant, get money for that and go and buy yourself some nice food and get this oxytocin right. release. It's, right. It's, Finally. It's, it's right there. It's, yes, it's the right. It's, it's, it's right, right in the session. There. So okay. that's why we do that effectively, because it is it's an immediate reward. Right. Second component is intellectual. 
that's the reverse mentoring part because we learn a lot from our mentees if they are good. Okay. On, the, on the third is financial, and it's very uni uniform across the whole mentors I spoke with. Okay. And this emotional part, it's a key to understanding why many mentoring relationships either don't work or underperform, mm -hmm. because how the matching normally works. You let people speak with each other for 10-15 minutes, mm -hmm. and then you decide, okay, I like them better than the, than the rest. Okay. Again, hardly scientific, right? Right, right. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. so now I am considering to make a proper psychological profiling and matching. For that matching mentorship. Yes, and we okay. need to have actually two metrics effectively. We need a matrix of psychological compatibility between mentors and mentees. Okay. Again, scientific one. A second one is in knowledge. Okay. We need to understand which mentor fits the knowledge gaps best. Right. Again, we need first to check the knowledge level, because if the knowledge level is below a certain level, it will not be mentoring, it will become teaching. So right. for mentoring to be efficient, you need first to eliminate the knowledge, to, to deepen the knowledge gap, and then right. start mentoring. It's a different process. So that's the program of how to do mentoring, matching right, and then set it up and continue working, which is based on my research we are trying to establish now. But effectively what we're doing in Alchemy in terms of investment, we do mostly early stage B2B or B2B2C companies mm -hmm. in SaaS and in media and entertainment okay. in, uh, in the States and in Europe, across Europe, basically. Somehow we are more focused on Southern and Western Europe. Okay. We don't do much in Nordics and uh, Central Europe, which is our problem, okay. not the problem of those regions for sure, right, right. which we are trying to address now and <laughs> devote more uh, like more attention to these places because there's tons of great companies yeah. coming out of there. And another thing that we do in Cyprus together with Deloitte, in association with Deloitte. Yeah, yeah, I wanted to ask about the association with yeah. Deloitte. Like, it's like... the program which when we bring foreign scale-ups in, in Cyprus, using that as a launch pad and a sandbox for the European expansion. Okay. So for that, we don't do the early stage companies. Normally, it's a different story. It's a very typical one. We need some company which already has sales and product and home market mm -hmm. understanding that they have potential in europe to, to okay. scale because not all the products will be successful for sure for different reasons Absolutely. and if that's the case yeah we help them with deloitte to launch it and from again from establishing the company opening right. get account, bank accounts getting job permits the whole way to the demo day with investors and assistance with sales Great, great. Uh, working with Southern Europe and Western Europe uh, companies, what are the trends that you are seeing uh, for this internationalization? Like, what are these companies based in, let's say, I don't know, France, Portugal, Spain, or, or Western Europe are, are, are going to? Are they going into the Nordic, Nordics? Are they going into Eastern Europe? Are, are they going into the US directly? And what about the US companies that are trying to come here? What are the trends that, are you, that, that you're looking at from, from Alchemy Ventures? The biggest problem for European Union is that the market is still siloed. And right. the problem is like mostly the language barrier. Mm. It's language and culture, effectively. Mm. More language than culture, because if you take a look at the States, it's still a single market with yep. a lot of cultural differences. A lot of cultural differences. But yeah. it's the same with Latin America, like, like this true, Spanish. True, and... but still language brings people together. Right. And that's a big European problem. Interestingly, probably Brexit will help because English now is kind of a neutral language, you know. Right. There's right, right. not now yeah. not speaking anything bad about Ireland. Yeah. <laughs> There's not no big player for whom the English is a is a government country language. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a neutral mm. kind of base everybody can agree can agree upon. Mm. And more and more young people they start speaking this a new language Franca. <laughs> the English language, or globish, as it is. Yeah. <laughs> English tend to call it. The same language that we're speaking, right? Yes, to exactly. Each other. Yeah. exactly. But they, and that's what will be happening, but it will still take a lot of time. Right. And I think 
the road to success goes through investors, not through startups. Okay. Startups are ready to work with international investors. Right. Investors are not ready to work with international startups, okay. at least the angel investors. Why, why are they not ready? Like, like, what do you mean when you say they're not ready? Investors? The problem is they somehow believe that uh, risks are lower in the home country. Kind of, yeah. they know the ground, yeah. they know the tradition, they know the legal system, whatever. Mm. It's a mistake, fairly speaking. Another problem is that the tax incentives are kind of country based now. Right. And that's a big job for the European Commission to kind of set a, a common structure. Mm. So if you invest in a startup in the European Union, wherever it is, you can have, you know, like your ta tax benefits at home. Right. It will take a lot of, I think, haggling back and forth, but yeah, well, it's, a lot it's small bank. money effectively for European Union, right. but it's a big deal for early stage investors. Mm. So it's just, you know, this inertia of mind. Right. It still needs to be addressed. And as Hegel said, whatever is reasonable is unavoidable. Right. The problem is, will it happen in a year or in 10 years time? So we need to eliminate these barriers to investing in other countries of European Union and then as investors start to invest massively across the borders, same as VC do. Mm. So when the company has grown, VC don't care. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Angels care very much and that's a big deal. We need to deal with this problem. As soon as it's away from the table, we'll see a massive growth of international companies from like maybe not day one, but day two. But in telling where they're going, even Spanish companies for whom like the LATAM was normally kind of a pre predetermined way, right. they turned east, so to say, from Spain or north. Right. So they go to France, they go to Germany, they go to Italy, to big European markets because it's kind of easier still. Right. Even with a different language, it became yeah. easier to scale. I have many companies which I see which go this way. Some others still go to Latin. So it's two viable ways yeah. to do that. For example, Germans don't have this advantage. Exactly. They have DACH yeah, yeah. countries in the central of Europe. They can just benefit from the same language there. So they have to invest wherever they, they may, may invest. Yeah, yeah, I feel like that's one of the biggest trends in the Spanish market. Like we have such a huge market that we tend to stay in this market because yeah it, it, it is huge but if we could only see beneath that into the you know all of the other markets that are here in europe maybe maybe things could be different maybe leading into the into the final questions of of, of the interview i have two questions that I, that i love to ask and actually one of the questions i actually saw in, in one of your other interviews so for so so this is just great hopefully i will give you the same answer if we'll i remember see, we'll, right. see. <laughs> we'll see you actually said in that interview if if i remember correctly uh, that Uh, you like the um, uh, the emotions of investing in early stage because uh, because they lack the productivity of real estate, something like that. So, so what I tend to ask uh, most investors and business angels is, why do you choose to invest in such a risky market as as early stage startups? Like, what drives you to do it? That's a good question. <laughs> And uh, the answer will be probably longer than I expected. <laughs> uh, to do it successfully, you need to make a strong long-term commitment. Right. And you need to understand this model, to embrace the risks and to be able to manage the risks. Mm -hmm. Meaning, if you invest in early stage company, you will be there for seven, ten years, maybe longer. Yeah. If well, you're really understand. lucky, if you're really lucky, it's yeah. three years time, but it's kind of very large outlier. Mm. So five, seven, ten years. And it's not enough to invest into three companies and wait. It's right. still a power law distribution. It's not even about spray and pray. No, you need to really analyze those companies, understand why you invest, understand how competition will change going forward in your opinion, at least. Right. And why this company will keep the sustainable advantage. But why I do that, two things. Uh, when we speak, we need to have, you know, as investors, we need to have a stake, diversified portfolio. And we have need to have a part of our risk assets. That the finest risk assets you can have. Okay. And the one you can really analyze and 
influence what's happening. Because if you invest in crypto, it's my favorite part, because you never invest in crypto, you speculate with crypto. Yeah, you speculate. It's, so far, yeah. Yes. No, investing is analyzing something. You know, in, <laughs> so if you can't analyze, you speculate. So this is, for me, it's not fun. It's only, you know, only your nerves. <laughs> right, right. In startups, you can... Also, you do a lot of good if you do it right. Yeah, what's the difference between startup investor and angel investor, right? Mm. Startup investor basically invests money. Mm -hmm. Angel investor invests money, time, knowledge, yeah. all these things. And if you don't want to do that, but you like the asset class, okay, invest into somebody's fund or funds. Exactly. And wait, delegate exactly. to the to the knowledgeable people managing your money. Yeah. If you want to have fun, if you want to help people, if you want to have an influence, you invest directly. Invest directly and engage. Okay. And uh, maybe my last question, one of my favorites, is: What is your biggest failure or biggest win in the startup world? Like, what's that one story that you're gonna tell your grandchildren forever and ever? <laughs> Okay, I hope that my biggest gain is still ahead. <laughs> and my biggest fail is behind. It's already in the past, yeah. Yes. Hopefully. Uh, I had my fair share of uh, unsuccessful investments, of course. Mm -hmm. And again, not even uh, not even naming the names, the biggest thing to not be very disconcerted with the failure because it's mm -hmm. part of the game yes. it's making your own decision just avoid hard mentality or fear of missing out so if you made your own decision if you analyze it properly and you can't you know tell yourself you're stupid <laughs> like why did you do that yeah but you have to tell yourself not yes no else. yourself because yeah. i have a few investments like this when I'm just asking myself, why are you so stupid doing that? <laughs> right. And I hope that I will never be in a position to ask myself the same question. <laughs> yeah. okay. And in terms of the biggest successes, I have, uh, again, yeah, not a unicorn, I have a company which was invested into by Anderson Horowitz a couple of years ago at the valuation of several hundred million. Okay. And I expect it to become a unicorn. But I still expect uh, plenty of my investments to be successful. But for me, it's also important to see that I earn money doing something nice, effectively helping the, mostly the founders. I care about the founders a lot because a good team consists of normally of good people you know? right <laughs> and it's really like a rewarding feeling right. that you helped good people succeed yeah that's that's great and <laughs> so thank you very much for sharing i feel like this could be the end of of our interview with that with that great phrase that you said so then again thank you so much for coming and my hope pleasure to see you very soon okay you will <laughs> yeah, of course. thank you everybody thank you. bye bye